Hi, I'm Alistair, and in this video I'd like to show you how I made this secret bookcase door. So this looks like a regular bookcase, except if you pull a particular book forward on the shelf, it moves the bookcase, allowing you to access a secret passageway behind it. Now, this is a pretty common trope that you might have seen in spy movies or in shows like Scooby-Doo, and when I started researching this video, I did find a couple of other people had already created similar doors. I even found one company that actually installs them in your home to be able to create a secret room to keep your valuables safe, or perhaps to keep other goings on in your house secret. But this is playful technology, so I'm not interested in home security. I just wanted to create an interesting, playful interaction so you could use it in an escape room, for example. So I took a slightly different approach, and I'm going to talk you through what I did. So let's start by taking a closer look at the construction of the bookcase itself. Um, so I built this out of uh, furniture panels like this, but if you've got an existing bookcase lying around, obviously you can use that instead. The main modification you're going to make is that instead of having a regular back panel here, you're actually going to mount it directly onto a door. So uh, this is a cheap fire door that I bought. This cost about £40. So it's simple, unpainted wood. And what you can see is I've uh, screwed the frame of the bookcase onto the door here. Now, um, if we were to try to hang the entire frame of the bookcase and all these books directly off the door, it would probably weigh so much that it would pull the door off its hinges. So what I did was to place caster wheels on the bottom of the bookcase, and it's those wheels that are actually uh, bearing the load and all the weight of those books and the frame itself. So what I've essentially got here is I've got a freestanding wheelie bookcase with no back uh, that is screwed onto the door here. So it pivots around the door hinges as the door is opened and closed. So that brings us on to the mechanism used to initially secure the bookcase in place and then to allow it to move when the particular book is pulled. And there are a couple of different ways I considered to do this. Uh, the first one was to use a spring-loaded catch, a bit like this one. Uh, so these are often used to open garage doors. And what you could do is to secure that onto the back of the uh, bookcase at the top here, have a cable running down from the catch, uh, down the back of the bookcase, through to the front, and then if you were to secure that uh, to the book that you wanted to pull, it would pull the cable all the way down, pull the catch down and allow the door to open. But actually, although I, I quite liked the idea of a low-tech, purely mechanical mechanism, I decided against it for a couple of reasons. Now the first reason is from a game design point of view. Because there's a direct mechanical link between the book that players pull and the lock at the top of the bookcase, there's not really a puzzle to solve here. I mean, players are meant to identify the correct book to pull, but in practice there's nothing to just stop them going along the entire shelf and pulling every book, and eventually they'll come across the one that has the cable on the back of it that will release the lock. Likewise, there's no real way to gate the flow of this puzzle. As soon as players have access to the bookcase, there's nothing to stop them doing that and opening it up and accessing the area beyond. Now, conversely, there's also no way for a games master to remotely intervene and solve the puzzle. So if players are having a hard time identifying which book to pull for whatever reason, there's no remote override that could be offered, for example, from a, a games master control room or something like that. The next reason was um, purely to do with the layout of where physically the book can be placed on the shelf, again limited by that need to have a direct mechanical link to the lock at the top. I mean, sure, you can run it through pulleys and things like that, but ultimately you're somewhat limited in your 
placement of where the book can be on the shelf. You can't have a book on a shelf above a fireplace and pulling it will activate a latch somewhere else in the room, for example. But the final reason was a safety concern. Whenever you design any kind of escape room that has an area that players potentially could get uh, shut in or locked behind, then you need to have absolutely guaranteed safety that they're able to get out again. So suppose that the players pulled the book, the bookcase opened and they went inside and then for whatever reason the bookcase closed behind them again. Uh, the latch at the top here would uh, snap back up and the bookcase would become closed. Now in theory players should be able to reach up from the inside and pull the lock down to be able to release themselves again. But let's say there was a power cut, whatever reason, if the lights went out, maybe the players are simply a bit too short to be able to pull up and reach that. There are lots of reasons I didn't feel entirely comfortable about having this as a lock that was securing players in, if, unless there was uh, any other entry or exit way from this area. So for that reason, I uh, decided on a different approach instead, and I went for an electronic solution. And the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed uh, the maglock, which I have secured on the door frame here, and the armature plate on the inside of the door. Uh, so these are going to be held electronically shut, and if there's any reason for the door to be released, the power is going to be cut automatically uh, and the door will open. Now to control an electronic lock, we're going to need some electronic switches. Uh, so I'm using micro switches like this that have a lever arm on the top of them. And you can see they've got three contacts on the bottom. Now when the lever is up, the common and the normally closed contacts are connected. And when the lever is pushed down, the common and the normally open contacts will become connected instead. And then what I did was I uh, took my shelf from the bookcase and I decided where along the shelf I wanted the book to be positioned that players would have to push down on. And I've just drilled out a, a little hole at that part there. And then I 3D printed uh, just a small mount for the switch. Now you don't have to do this. Um, you can screw these switches in place or you can probably glue them in any way you uh, are able to do it. But I had a 3D printer available to me. So I'm just going to push the switch into that hole there. And I'll put a link to the, uh, the STL model for this if you want to use this. And then I simply uh, pushed it into the underside of the shelf there. So that now, sticking up above the shelf, hopefully you can see that, I've got the uh, little roller ball on the end of the lever there. So that when an object is placed down on the shelf, it pushes that down, and when it's released, um, it releases the lever. And I can get to the contacts from the underside of the shelf. Now, I don't want the book to be completely removed from the shelf. I simply want it to be uh, pivoted forwards and backwards again. So to prevent that, I then just got one of these tiny uh, hinges. I think these are sold for a doll's house hinges actually. They're very small. And I just mounted that on the front side of the shelf lined up with the switch and then I screwed through that hinge into the underside of the front of the book so that it allowed it to be uh, pivoted forwards and backwards in place and when it was placed down it activated that switch. Now, I should point out, if you don't want to do this with uh, real books, you can buy fake books, you can make books out of MDF, uh, or perhaps you want to have a mixture so that some of these books are real, some of them are fake. It really doesn't uh, matter. It can be any object at all, it doesn't even have to be a book. Just something that can be pivoted backwards and forwards on that shelf uh, and activates that switch when it does so. So how do we make this more puzzly? Well, the thing is now, we've no longer got a direct mechanical link between a single book and the latch at the top of the bookcase. What we've got is an electronic switch, which we can monitor the state of using an Arduino or other microprocessor. And that means we can introduce more complex logic to decide when the maglock should be released. For example, maybe the book has to be held forward for a certain number of seconds. Or maybe we've got more than one book, one on each shelf, and they all have to be pulled forward at the same time. Now, that still doesn't prevent the problem of having a player who comes along and simply pulls every book forward off the shelf. 
But suppose we had, let's say, uh, four books with switches underneath them, and they had to be arranged in the correct order of being pulled out or not. Now with four different books there are 16 possible arrangements of pulled forward or not. If you had five switches there would be 32 different combinations and that's probably going to be enough to deter most players from simply trying to brute force the solution. If you wanted to you could even have extra books that moved on hinges but didn't even have switches behind them so there's no additional wiring for you but it's another way of obfuscating the solution to players so that they're unable to just do it until they've solved the necessary prerequisites for the puzzle. So whatever solution state you decide on you can implement that in the code that's running on the microprocessor that's checking the state of however many switches you choose to implement and when players arrange the books in the correct state defined in the code here what happens is the Arduino sends a signal to a relay module that cuts the power to this maglock up here releasing the door. Now I've got a small spring mounted on the back of the door up here not sure if you can quite make that out on the camera here that causes the uh, door to be pushed slightly ajar when the puzzle is solved and also that's accompanied by a sound effect to let them know that they've solved the puzzle. They can then uh, pull the door open the rest of the way. Now I did consider having a linear actuator on this side of the door that would actually automatically move the bookcase to the side but I decided against that, again for safety reasons, I'm always a little bit uh, cautious of having large, heavy, mechanical moving objects in escape rooms, uh, especially ones that players are not necessarily expecting to move suddenly, for uh, fear of having uh, fingers or other body parts trapped. Um, so I've gone for quite a, a subtle movement, which is also a little bit easier to implement. Um, which is just to pop open slightly and then for players to pull it the rest of the way. And that's accompanied by that audio cue. I find that also if you have light in the area beyond the bookcase, as soon as it is popped slightly ajar, you can actually see that light extending around the side of the bookcase here and that will invite players to actually open it up further and to investigate um, what that new area that's been discovered is. So I feel like I've mentioned safety quite a few times in this video already, um, perhaps because this project is on a slightly larger scale than most of the projects I show in this channel. Um, but there's just one more feature I want to mention and that's uh, this button here. So this is an emergency door release button and there is one of these situated inside the hidden area just on the inside of the door frame here near the maglock and it is located at a convenient height to be able to push. And this is wired in line with the power supply that goes to the maglock at the top here, um, which means that if at any point somebody presses this button here, if somehow they've managed to get trapped to the wrong side of the door, this will immediately cut the power supply to that maglock. Um, it doesn't matter what state the books are in, it doesn't matter what the Arduino is doing, you know, the Arduino could have fallen off the wall, burst into flames, whatever, it doesn't matter. As soon as this button is pressed, that lock is going to release and this door can be opened. Um, this is a fail-safe mag lock, um, which again are always the sort of mag locks you should use if you're securing any kind of area that a player could potentially get trapped in, which means that if for whatever reason the power fails, if there's uh, electricity cut in the building, whatever, again, that's going to release and the door is going to open. Uh, okay, so I've talked about all the components, let me show you how they're wired together. So here's a fritzing illustration of the wiring and I hope this will be a lot easier to follow than if I attempt to actually show you the wires passing through and around the door itself. These are all components which I have used in previous projects anyway, so hopefully some of this will look pretty familiar to you. Uh, so starting on the left hand side we've got our inputs and I've shown three micro switches here but as I mentioned this can really be as many or as few as you want. You could have a single switch which is actually what I was using to demonstrate the video earlier 
or you could have uh, up to as many switches as you have inputs available on your microprocessor. And on the code, what we'll do is we'll define the state of either push down or release that each of those switches need to be in. Uh, you've got the common terminal on each of those switches, wired through to ground on the Arduino, and then you've got the normally open connector wired through to a unique GPIO pin. Now, I'm using the A0, A1 and A2 pins here, but you can really use any pin at all that's capable of receiving a digital input. Um, I'm showing them wired to an Arduino Uno, which is what I'm using, but again, you can use pretty much any Arduino here. You could use a Nano or a Mega or an ESP8266 or 32. It's really very light on requirements for the microprocessor itself. And then on this side, we've got the outputs. So I'm using a serial MP3 player. This is based on the uh, YX5300 chip, which I've used in a couple of other projects before. It's similar to the DF player, DF mini module, which I used to use for providing audio in a lot of my projects. But actually, I tend to favor this one now. I find it a little bit more robust, a little bit easier to work with, because you can simply plug it straight into ground and the 5 volt output of the Arduino. And then we've got receive and transmit lines, which are going to pins 9 and 8. Now I'm going to be using the Altsoft serial library to send commands over these serial wires here and that is restricted to only using those two pins. Uh, so 8 and 9 we are going to reserve for sending commands to the serial mp3 player. This has got an SD card in it which is going to have a single mp3 file saved on it which is going to play when the bookcase is released. And then I've got the headphone out from that. It's actually going to a small amplifier unit and then to a speaker inside the bookcase. This is all totally optional anyway. If you don't feel that you need to have the accompanying sound effect, maybe the bookcase makes enough noise on its own when it pops open, then you don't have to have that at all. And then I've also got the relay module. This is a 5 volt relay module. So both the MP3 player and the relay module run at 5 volts and they are provided power through this uh, 5 volt DC connector up here which is also shared with the ground of the Arduino. You can use that same 5 volt DC power to actually power the Arduino itself or you can power the Arduino through the USB port or through the barrel input here as well. But the relay module down here, this is what's going to control power to the maglock. So we've got it connected to 5 volt and to ground, and then it has a single trigger signal line input, which I've got connected to uh, pin 2 here. And when the Arduino writes a high or a low signal to that digital pin there, it's going to cause the relay module to flip a switch across internally, and that's going to switch from the normally open to the normally closed side on the load side of the relay here. So the effect of that is going to be to either make or break this circuit here, which is the circuit that supplies power from this 12 volt DC supply to the maglock. We've also got our emergency release button wired in line in that circuit. So the only way that the maglock is going to be receiving power and locked is if both the relay is closed and also the button is closed. I'm using a, a normally closed button, so in its default state when it's not pressed, this circuit here will be bridged. And we've also got the relay module here will be bridged, so this is a complete circuit current will flow from this DC adapter and power the maglock. But if either the button or if the relay are broken, so if the button is pressed, or alternatively, if the Arduino sends that signal there to break the relay here, this circuit will be broken and the maglock will release. And here's the code that's running on the Arduino. And at just over 100 lines of code, this is actually one of the shorter projects that I've made recently for this channel. But we'll still step through it line by line and I'll explain how it works. 
So as always, we start with a section of includes. So these are external libraries that have already been written and define some kind of common functionality that we are going to bring into our own sketch and make use of. So I've got uh, three external libraries I'm going to use. I'm including the bounce to library. That's going to help us read the input from those mechanical switches and make sure that we don't get any noise when they sort of chatter up and down a little bit when they're first pressed. I'm going to use the Altsoft serial library. That's because the Arduino Uno only has a single hardware serial interface. And we're going to be using that to send serial commands over the USB cable back to the PC, just to print some debug information about when a button has been pressed or if the puzzle has been solved or reset, something like that. But we also need a serial interface to communicate with the MP3 player. So to do that, we're going to use this Altsoft serial library. I've used this before. And as I mentioned in the wiring diagram, that is fixed to using pins 8 and 9 as secondary transmit and receive lines. And then we're also going to use this library here. This has got specific functions for controlling the audio player, which I'm going to use. And now you'll notice that I've got two slightly different sorts of syntax here. These first two libraries here, you can install from within the Arduino IDE by going uh, sketch include library and then manage libraries and when the library manager comes up if you search for the name of um, one of these libraries you'll see this is the bounce to library and I've installed that by clicking the install button here and the same for the alt soft serial library as well now when you install a library in this manner like this it gets installed into your Arduino sketchbook folder uh, which is normally on a Windows machine at least that will be in your username and then your documents Arduino libraries folder and from there you can include it in any new Arduino sketch you write by simply including the name of the header file you want to include in these angled brackets now this third library however I didn't install that through the same method this one was uh, I downloaded from this github repository here and I placed it directly into a subfolder of the folder that contains this sketch so it's a subfolder called src for source and then I've got the name of the module and then the header file here now because this is a locally saved library project it's not been installed through Arduino, Arduino IDE I'm going instead to include a, a relative file reference and then I'm going to include it in these speech marks instead so that's just two different ways for including external libraries in your project depending on where they're saved relative to the sketch these ones are installed through the Arduino IDE itself and get placed in a, a shared library this one is a local external library that's been saved in a directory relative to this project. Okay, then we get on to constants. So constants are configuration values that are going to remain the same for the entire duration of the sketch. Uh, so the first constant I've got is the total number of inputs that we're going to monitor. So as I mentioned, we've got three inputs here, three switches that books can be placed on. And these are the pins, the GPIO pins on the Arduino that those three switches are connected to. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define the solution. So the array of values that the three switches that are connected to these pins are going to be positioned in in order to solve the puzzle. Now see that these are defined as high and low values. And I put a little comment uh, at the top here partly to remind myself what this means so the switches we were connecting to the normally open contact of each of the switches and so that means that the uh, the switch is not normally connected which means that the pull-up resistor is pulling the signal on these GPIO pins to high so that means that the switch is not being pressed and the switch is not being pressed if the book has been lifted off if it's been pulled forward off the switch so high here means that this book has been pulled forward 
the book that is placed above the switch that is connected to A0 uh, has to be pulled forward. Low, so low means that the switch is being pressed down. That means that we have now got that continuous circuit from pin A1 through to ground, so it's going to read a low. And that means that the book is present. So a pattern of high, low, high means that this pin, the switch that's attached to this pin here, needs to be pulled. This book needs to not be pulled, and then this one does need to be pulled. And if you've got a different number of inputs, so in the example video, I was just showing you a single input, for example. In that case, I would change that to one. I would have my single switch connected to pin A0, let's say, and I did want that book to have to be pulled forward, so this one was high. That was the example that I demonstrated in the video earlier of just a, a single switch. And you can use that. The reason why we made it more complicated, if you recall, was to prevent the problem of players just coming along and, and pulling every book off the shelf. And if you want to add uh, more inputs, that's fine. You could extend this and you could add your new pins in here. And again, you would say, well, let's say we've got high, low, high, and we want this one to be pulled as well, but we don't want the fifth one to be pulled. So you can modify these patterns to reflect the state that you want the books on the shelf to be have to placed in in order to solve the puzzle. Um, and we also just tell the code which of the pins was connected through to the signal input on the relay module. And that's what's going to control power to the maglock. Then we get onto our globals. So Unlike constants, globals are values that are going to change while the code runs, and they're going to be shared between the different functions. So we'll declare them as what's called global variables that can be accessed from anywhere in the code. And we're going to keep track of what the last known state of each of the buttons was. So we're going to create an array, and that array is going to have one element for each input so it's going to have number of inputs elements and initially we just set that to be a value I've chosen low here because I'm assuming that at the outset every book is going to be positioned on the shelf and as we just said up here that means that the book hasn't been pulled forward so we'll get a low signal again if you've changed the number of inputs you also need to change the number of elements in this array to match whatever the value of number of inputs is there as well. So we'll say, okay, our default state when the puzzle starts up, we'll assume that every book is in place, we'll just initialize them all to low. We will create our alt software serial uh, emulated serial connection, which is going to allow us to communicate with the MP3 player, and we will actually create an MP3 object using that software serial connection as well. We will uh, now create a series of bounce objects. So bounce is the type of object that the bounce to library uh, contains. And what that means, you might have seen, if you've uh, seen a lot of Arduino code, you might see digital read used a lot to test the value of an input connected to a GPIO pin. And that's great, and it will tell you a low or high value, but whenever you're reading a mechanical input, uh, such as the micro switches that we're using here, you do have a problem which is referred to as bouncing. And that's when the contact is first pressed down, when it changes state, rather than going from a nice smooth value of just on to off, you'll find that it kind of flickers a little bit. It, bounce, it mechanically bounces up and down, and the contact is made and broken very quickly. Within a few milliseconds, it might bounce up and down several times. So to prevent that, that's why we're using this uh, bounce library. And we're not going to take a direct digital read from the GPIO pins that the switches are plugged into up here. Instead, what we're going to do is we'll assign a bounce object to them, and then we will read the output from the debounced switch state. So again, we need to have one bounce object for as many switches as you're going to use. Uh, so if you have five switches, you increase it to five. If you only wanted one, you'd delete all these. 
And we also have a state that we're just going to keep track of what the current state of the puzzle is. This is kind of a pattern that I've used in a lot of my code. So this will probably look familiar to you. This one's only got three states. It's got an initializing state, a locked state when the bookcase has not been solved and is still stuck to the wall, and an unlocked state when the maglock has been released and it's slid to the side. And we start off in the initializing state. And that's when we go into setup. So setup is the function that executes when the Arduino first receives power and it runs once. And unsurprisingly, it's used to set up all of the code and the hardware. So the first thing we're going to do is to initialize our serial connection. Now this is the hardware serial connection. It's not the Altsoft serial connection. This is the one that's actually uh, built into the hardware on the board. Uh, so we will create a serial connection at 115.200 board rate and we'll just print out the file name and the date at which this code was compiled. Again, this is a pattern which I've used in a lot of my projects now. This is just really useful when you first plug an Arduino into a PC and connect the serial monitor. You can see what code and what version of that code is currently running on the board. Um, I found that a really useful way of kind of keeping my, my boards catalogued, as it were, to make sure I know what's running on each one. We will then attach each of our debounce objects onto the relevant input pin. So we'll loop over as many inputs as we've defined. So it could be one, could be three, could be five, however many. And we'll go to the book switches array that we defined up here. That was our array of bounce objects. We'll take the corresponding bounce object at that position of the array and we will attach it to the input pin. So we'll take the first bounce object will be attached to input pin A0. The second bounce object will be attached to input pin A1, etc, etc. And we will define input pull-up. So that means that when there is no uh, input received on the GPIO pin, when the switch is not being pressed, it will be pulled up to a high signal internally. When the button is pressed, that's when the circuit will connect through to ground and read a low signal instead. We'll initialize the pin that we defined as the lock pin, so the one that's taking the signal to the relay module. We'll initialize that as an output and its initial state will be high. Some relay modules are what's called active high, some are active low. I'm using an active low module, so I'm initially going to have it high and then I'm going to set it to be low when the puzzle is solved later. Um, it might be that your relay module is the inverse of that. That's very simple to change. You simply go through here and you change all the highs to lows and all the lows to high, and that's it. And having done that setup, we can also update the overall mode of the controller to say, okay, we're now in the locked state because we have just secured the lock here. Uh, the next bit of the setup function uh, just relates to the mp3 player. So again, this is totally optional. If you don't want to have the sound effect, you can just ignore this bit completely. Um, but if you do want to have it, we're going to initialize our secondary serial interface. Now, this one can't be as fast as the hardware serial interface. So we're using 115,000 up here. Now we're only going to use 9,600 board rate, which is the board rate expected of most of these devices. Uh, we'll begin that interface and we will, uh, so this basically says um, when you are sending simple trigger messages to the MP3 player, which is what we're going to be doing, we're only going to be playing a single sound effect, we will send them in a synchronous manner, which is the, the simplest way to, to send messages over that serial interface. Um, don't worry too much about that. And we'll also set the uh, the volume level. Now, as I said, I'm going through to an amplifier anyway, an external power amplifier. So I don't really need the volume to be that loud uh, from the serial player itself. Uh, so I've set it to 20 out of a, a scale of 30, so two thirds volume level, but you can tweak that empirically. And then we get onto the loop function. So the loop function runs over and over and over again for as long as the Arduino is powered up. 
And this is where we actually implement all the logic that says to test whether the puzzle has been solved and also to act upon it if it has. So what we need to do to test whether the puzzle is solved is to loop over all of these switches. And before we do that, we're just going to create a Boolean flag that we've called puzzle solved. So in this particular iteration through the loop cycle, this value is going to say, OK, well, has the puzzle been solved? And we're going to initially assume that it has been. And when I first sort of started programming, I always got a bit confused by that. You'd think by default, surely you'd assume it hasn't been solved and then change it to, to true if it has. But actually, as you'll see in a moment, it, it works much better the other way around because we'll assume it has been solved. And then if any of the switches are not in the correct state, we can say at that point straight away, no, actually, it hasn't been solved. And we don't even need to bother checking any of the remaining switches. As soon as one of them is wrong, we can reverse the state of this. Whereas if you'd initially started off by saying, well, let's say the puzzle solved is false, you kind of then have to keep track of, well, have all the switches we've discovered so far been set to the correct value or not? So it might seem kind of set up the reverse way if you're not familiar with this particular programming pattern, but actually uh, this is an efficient way to do it. So we'll assume it has been solved, but then we'll loop through all the inputs and find out whether there's anything that suggests that's actually not the case. So we'll update the book switches array. So this was that array of debounced objects, and we'll update the one if this position of the num inputs. And we will read what its current state is. So this is going to give us a high or a low value based on whether this particular switch is currently being pressed or not. Now, if the current state of the switch that we've just read up here, if that's different to the last known state we knew about this switch, then either a book has been replaced back on the shelf or it's been tilted forwards. And in either of those two cases, this is where we're just going to send some debug information to the serial monitor. So if you've got your Arduino connected via a USB cable to your PC and your PC is running the Arduino IDE like this, you could go to tools and to serial monitor here. And this would display this printed output every time uh, the state of the puzzle was changed. And this is a really useful way to debug any kind of Arduino prop controllers you might be running. Liberally sprinkle these serial.print commands anywhere in your code that you have a value that changes or things that you're, you know, the current state of the puzzle or something you expected to change. Or you can even write certain points of your code just to say, this is whereabouts in the code I've got to. And then if you've got any kind of strange behavior or stuff hanging or, or not proceeding as you're expected to, you can look at that log of all the serial commands that have been printed out to that serial monitor there. And it's just really useful to kind of view inside the code what's going on at that point. So here we'll print that if the current state is different to the last known state, well, we'll say what's happened to it. It's changed either to high or low from where it was. And we will also then update the array of what the last known state of this input was just so next time we're dealing with the updated value. And then we will compare what the current state is to the position on the solution pattern for this particular input. So we'd expect the first input to be equal to the first element in the solution pattern, the second input to the second element, or the rest of it. But if any of them are not equal to here, then we can say that the puzzle has not been solved. So that's that uh, kind of logic which I explained at the top. We'll start off assuming it has been, then we'll loop over all of them, and if any of them are not equal to the value of the solution pattern for that element, then the puzzle has not been solved. Now once we've finished looping over all the inputs, then we can act upon whether the puzzle has been solved or not, and that's what these two lines here do. So if the current mode is that the uh, puzzle is locked, so the mag lock is on and the bookcase has been secured, but the puzzle solved flag is true, well that means that the puzzle has just been solved. The last book has either been lifted or replaced in position like it's meant to. So at that point we can print a little debug message again. 
we can send a command to the MP3 player over that emulated software serial link and we'll tell it to play the first and as it happens only track on the SD card. So it's going to, to play a file. Um, I've named mine uh, 001.mp3 on the SD card. I think actually if you've only got one file on the SD card you can name it anything you want um, because it's only going to play that one. Um, so yeah, I'm only using one audio effect for this particular puzzle. We will then write a low signal to the lock pin GPIO. That is what's going to trigger the relay module to flip over, cut power to the mag lock and release the door. And we will also update the status of the controller. So all of that is when the puzzle has just been solved, when the last book has been correctly set in its place. And this section here, well, you might want to modify the behavior here, but this is what I've got to relock the puzzle again. So if the uh, mode, if the current mode is that the puzzle is unlocked, and now the puzzle is no longer solved, what that means is that the bookcase has been opened and then someone has changed the state of one or more of the books so that they are no longer in the correct position. And that's what I'm going to use to reset the puzzle, to relock the maglock uh, ready for the next game. So in that case, again, print a little bit of debug information. And it's kind of the opposite of what the code was above. We don't need to bother playing a, an MP3 file when the uh, bookcase is locked again. I mean, you can if you want, just to show that the puzzle has been reset. We will write a high signal to energize the lock again, and we'll change the mode back to mode locked. Now, if you wanted to, you could actually remove this line completely, because that would prevent the problem of players ever getting stuck behind the bookcase, because once it had been unlocked and players accessed the other area, no part of this code would ever actually lock the lock again. It would take a full reset of the Arduino to um, go back through the setup function and to relock the lock pin at this point here. Or perhaps you want to add uh, some other code if you use external game management software, such as Node-RED or something like that, and maybe you want to be able to remotely access the controller here and lock or relock it remotely this is also where you could incorporate uh, the code to do that so it's pretty easy to customize really in lots of different ways depending on the exact behavior you want to have so that brings me to the end of this video i hope you found it interesting and informative um i had a lot of fun building this it's a larger project than I've normally demonstrated and it also uh, let me use some woodworking skills which is something which I desperately need to improve so I was very grateful for that opportunity. Um, now I should mention that if you don't have the uh, opportunity to use a bookcase in your room there's actually many other puzzles that could use the same underlying mechanics that I demonstrated here. What we've got is a set of objects that are in two states. It could be a book that's either pulled forward or not on a shelf, but it could be almost any object. And you could use the same code and exactly the same approach that we used here on a much smaller scale or a completely different theme if you wanted to as well. As always, I want to say thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters whose very kind donations enable me to create these videos every month. I will upload the code which I demonstrated and the wiring diagrams and everything else over onto my Patreon account shortly where they can be downloaded from there. And if you'd like to find the archive of all of my previous escape room projects I've shown in this channel, they're all available there. I'll put the link below. If you are able to and if you'd like to support me to create these videos in the future, that would be amazing. But if you can't or if you don't want to, then don't worry about it. I will still upload them here for YouTube for you to view in the future. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments about this project or about any other escape room projects, do please let me know and I'll do my best to get back to you. And otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much for watching. Okay, bye.